Now that we've discussed Lilo in some detail, I'd like you to take a look at one of the more modern bootloaders, called Grub, or Grand Unified Bootloader. Now, Grub is actually more popular than Lilo simply because it's newer and has significantly more features. Now, the main reason that a lot of the new Linux users prefer Grub is because we don't have to reconfigure Grub using a particular command. We actually have a lot of configuration options but we don't have to go through the whole recompile the image, load the image to the proper location, reboot the system, and then pull the image. Grub is more of a program than it is a script in the newer Linux operating systems. So it allows for significant flexibility. There's actually a couple of quick things to know about Grub before we actually take a look at it. Its configuration file is usually located under boot grub and grub.conf. And this is going to contain configuration options very similar to our lilo.configuration file we saw previously. Now there's a couple of different ways to install grub. And we're going to take a look at these in our Linux operating system in just a moment. But basically you can run an install script or you can jump into the grub command and configure it from there. We'll also talk a little bit about some of the grub options as well as the DS message option that will allow you to look at boot log files. So let's take a look at Red Hat and some of the grub options that we have. So first of all, I'd like to just take a look at the grub configuration file, which as we mentioned is located under boot grub grub.conf. And these are our actual configuration options. Anything you notice here that has the pound sign before it is actually commented out and not used by the system to boot. So there are actually very few lines here. In contrast with what we saw in the Lilo configuration file, it only takes a few commands in the configuration file to make Grub operate properly. In this example, you can see our default is our first image, or zero. Our timeout is only 10 seconds. so it's going to boot directly into the default selection within 10 seconds of booting into Grub. It gives us our splash image, and you can see here the kernel that we're actually going to boot. So let's say, for example, we haven't installed Grub yet. And it may be that we don't know which individual physical drive or partition we want to install Grub to. Well, the interesting thing about Grub is that it actually doesn't know the difference between IDE and SCSI hard drives. So it actually just calls it HD0 through 3, usually designated for IDE drives, and HD4 is usually used for SCSI drives or better. The second space you see here after the comma is actually the partition on the individual drive. So this way, regardless of the drive and its individual hardware, Grub can treat it all the same. Now for consistency purposes, generally, Grub will boot IDE first, followed by SCSI. Now let's say, for example, we haven't installed Grub yet. So I mentioned there are two different ways to accomplish this goal. We have our install script grub-install, and then we see some options that are available to us. For example, if we want to choose our directory, we can simply type in root directory equals, and then the actual path. For example, for us, it would be boot followed by the grub, which it will automatically add in for us. We can specify that. We'll give it its hard drive. And this would actually install it, assuming that it was set up correctly. I actually don't have any corresponding BIOS drives. Not a big deal. I just wanted to show you exactly how the Grub installation script works. Now, in addition to that, you can actually drop into the Grub program. And we can see some of the options available to us listed out here. Now, for example, if we wanted to actually install it, we would simply type in setup. And if we weren't sure where we wanted to install it, we just start our open parentheses and press the tab key 
and it will actually present us with drives that are set up to accept the grub setup. Now if we want to see what partitions are available, we simply press tab again and it displays the available partitions and their associated file systems. Now in addition to troubleshooting grub through its command line, we can actually move into the DS message command which will allow us to view any boot logging that has been presented by grub during the startup of the operating system. So if we wanted to set up so that we can view our actual boot up logging options, then we can simply type in the dmessage command and pipe it into more so that we can view any logs provided by grub during the startup process for the computer. We can simply use our spacebar to move page after page and see if any problems were presented. And if you'll notice, toward the end here, I actually have a couple of errors with my CD-ROM, and I believe there's a floppy error mixed in there as well. So this can be pretty handy when troubleshooting Grub during the startup process.